the power of player development. So every year with more and more technology and more and more addition of like data, right? Uh, more and more teams know what they're looking for. But there's a huge difference between knowing what groceries you need to get from the store and actually knowing how to cook them, right? There's a big difference between those two things. And one of the things that I think has been the most challenging for people is understanding the difference between feel and real, okay? So here we have uh, two of the best hitters in the game, two of the more complete hitters in the game. They both hit for average, they both hit for power, they're both really consistent. We got Freddie Freeman on the left and J.D. Martinez on the right. Now, Freddie Freeman, you know, high school draft pick, uh, I think he was a second rounder, uh, elite hitter, right? Uh, always has been. Um, came up very old school, came out of California. Uh, he wants to think to swing down and he'll fight you over it and he wants to focus on hitting ground balls to the shortstop every day He wants to hit ground balls and then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum You have JD Martinez, right? He represents kind of the new school the guy who was a 4a player that you know Wasn't really succeeding when he was getting his shots in the big leagues and then he made a decision to make a swing change And one of the biggest things for him was thinking to actually swing up and understanding that the ball needed to meet the bat on an upward trajectory. He never wants to hit a ground ball ever again. He says it all the time, right? So you have completely different guys with completely different thought processes that both create really good results. And I think it's important to understand why, okay? So let's take a look at their spray chart. So on the left, we have Freddie Freeman from the 16 and 17 seasons, right? The green represents ground balls. The red represents line drives. The blue represents fly balls. And the black represents home runs. He's a left-handed hitter, and we see a tremendous amount of green on the pull side, right? We're not so much oppo. In a two-year stretch, we got like 12 green dots in the infield on the ground ball of the opposite field, right? Let's take a look at the red. Line drives sprayed everywhere. It's line drives all over, but we're gonna see some heavy pockets to the pole side. Blue, fly balls. They're everywhere, but they're predominantly to the opposite field, right? And home runs, they're spread out, they're everywhere, okay? So now let's take a look at JD. Uh, he's a right-handed hitter. Green, predominantly pole side. Opposite field green, not so much, right? Red, sprayed everywhere, right? Pockets to the pull side. Blue, sprayed everywhere, but really heavy, predominantly oppo. And black, home runs everywhere. So you have two different hitters that are both really successful that have totally different thought process, right? But they create the same data and statistics at the end of the day, okay? As coaches, we have to continue to evolve and understand that different players are gonna need different things. And we have to understand how everything affects everything else, okay? And words are powerful, feels are powerful. So when you take a look at this swing from Freddie Freeman, does that look like he's swinging down or up? Because I'll tell you what, to me, looking from the front view, he has one of the most vertical barrels in Major League Baseball. But when you really think about it, it makes sense. If you have a guy, right, that hooks too much, gets around the ball, pulls off, and you tell him to think oppo, right? Essentially, right now, he's making contact over here all the time, right? So he's gonna think oppo to make contact to go that way, but a lot of times, they'll actually pull the ball, pull the ball more effectively, right? Pull the ball, so it's a timing thing, right? He's thinking this way to hit the ball this way. The swing works the same north to south as it does east to west. When you have a swing that's that vertical in trajectory, if you think up, you're gonna be up too early, right? You're gonna be under everything, right? When you really think about the swing like that arc we talked about earlier, okay? Like, what, what would swing down help a guy like this do? Well, it's gonna help him move his barrel this way so it can get up out front where and when it needs to. It's just his version of thinking oppo to pull the ball better. He's thinking down to hit it on the upward trajectory. Right? It, it's, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to understand that, right? And, and the reality is all of this information affects everybody differently. Let's see what Pedro has to say about you, you, you threw it out in front of your face? Yes, I wanted to kind of... try to get as far as tall a play as you can. I wanted to have an imaginary tube where I wanted to have my, my hand, where I kind of wanted to see it and then follow the ball. And this gets exposed and doesn't have the time to get properly on top like it should.
there you have one of the greatest pitchers in the history of Major League Baseball, right? Doing a segment on MLB Network, talking about his feels, and then, and then talking about arm injuries. And saying that, you know, on a breakdown of another pitcher, that he didn't have time to get properly on top like he should. Is that where he actually threw from? No. Is that where he thought to throw from? Yes. Right? When you tell little kids to get on top of the ball, right, they do this. Pedro Martinez didn't do that. He threw from here, but then when he thought to get on top, he, he just tilted his trunk a little bit, right? He altered his plane of rotation, but the arms still move the way it needed to move, right? There's just a huge difference between what people think they do and then what they actually do. And it's really important to bridge that gap. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the guy thinks. It matters if it works, okay? And when we think about all these hitters, right, these are some elite hitters throughout the history of the game. Do you think they all have the same thoughts, the same feels, do the same drills? No, right? When we take a look at Barry Bonds, he was a huge, he talked a lot about how his bottom hand was his power hand, but his top hand was the most important. That was his guide hand. That's how he struck the ball. In this video, he was taught, literally talking about how he wanted to put the tee back and roll his wrist through the ball. Literally roll his wrist through the ball so he could get his top hand through it, right? How many of us as coaches are telling players that they need to roll their wrists into impact, right? Rather than forcing everybody to stay inside. That was a huge piece of his routine. You look at Alex Bregman and think about that famous clip of him talking about hitting. He likes to think about how he's got flashlights on his shoulders and his hips and he wants to keep them facing to the opposite field while he pulls his hands across his face. Is that what actually happens? No. Is that what he is absolutely thinking and methodically working on doing that he knows is helping him hit? Yes, okay? We look at Jose Altuve doing a segment on MLB Network talking about where did his power come from? How did you all of a sudden start hitting for more power? Well, he was hitting with Miguel Cabrera one off season in Venezuela. Miguel Cabrera talked to him about scissoring and kicking back and then he started doing it and all of a sudden the juice increased. I wonder why, right? Uh, you know, the, these guys, the greatest in history, it's not that they understand the biomechanics, although they, they actually do. They understand a lot about what you need to feel to make it happen. Think about that video of Hank Aaron in the last presentation. We need to do a better job, not just saying, oh, what you're saying is ridiculous. They know what they're trying to feel. The greatest of all time are the most consistent. They know what it feels like when it's right, and they know what it feels like when it's off, and they know how to get it back. They know what they need to think, what drills they need to do to get themselves right. And I really want to lock in on the Pujols one, and I want to lock in on the A-Rod one, because both of these guys really talked about keeping that barrel above the hands, right? Get that barrel above the hands, right? And when you look at it on video, like from the side, the barrel's not above the hands, barrel's below the hands, right? So everybody says, oh, that's ridiculous, that's ridiculous. Well, wait, not so fast, right? Not so fast. So let's think about this for a second. When you chop a piece of wood, right, you don't want this wrist to go under. You want a strong wrist and a strong top hand so you can deliver that ax head with that top hand, okay? His barrel was above his hands in relation to his spine. Right, so if I stand even with my shoulders and I put my barrel above my hands, well, you know, it, it's above, right? But if I tilt my trunk this way, my barrel can be above my hands in relation to my spine, but also below the ball on video at the same time. Think about how profound that is for a second. Think about that. They knew exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're trying to feel, right? And these things, the reason that they're so important to them is because these guys meticulously work on their craft. Their feel is different and better than, than most others, right? So again, we have to continue to do a better job as coaches of trying to understand what they're saying versus what's actually happening, okay? When we look at feel versus real, when you really think about the science, it proves that the old school was more right than they are wrong. Think about the last example. Think about swing down, right? If I think about swinging up, 
right? I might drop this way instead of this way. If I think about swinging up, I might not be able to create that compression into my front leg because my energy is gonna come up out of the ground instead of compressing that lead leg down into the ground, right? That thought of down, I think it helped a lot of guys really put their body in a position where they were rotating with posture efficiently this way, helping them stop on that lead side, right? And the swing is an arc. It's going down before it's traveling up, okay? The information wasn't the problem. The problem is that every individual interprets information differently. If I tell five different players to get their hands back when they hit, you're gonna see five different movements. But if all this is a result of how we move, and there are good positions and bad ones, like, their interpretation means everything. If we tell them something and they don't interpret it well, it's a bad thought, it's a bad cue, it's a bad drill, okay? And one of the things we like to say is that everything works and everything sucks, because that's the truth. It does. Everything's right for someone and not right for someone else. And our job as coaches is to build a huge toolbox and figure out what things affect what and how we can alter and change those patterns in our players, right? Mookie Betts, the adjustment Mookie Betts made in the middle of his slump. It came as a result of watching video and taking pieces of advice from teammates and coaches. But the key was being aware of what he was thinking while not overdoing it, right? But being aware. Players need to be aware. They, they need to understand what's actually happening first before they can actually create any kind of effective change, okay? And that's why you have to start with evaluations. I, I haven't worked with any player in the last 10 years, 11 years now, without doing an evaluation. It never made sense to me that all these players, they have all these different coaches, they, they switch teams all the time, they got their private guy, their high school, they got three different coaches, right? They got their travel ball. Everyone's telling them different stuff. An evaluation gives you the opportunity to get on the same page figure out where they're coming from, understand what they don't do well. This happens to be an evaluation of a professional player that we got to work with uh, the last couple off seasons, but uh, this was from his first off season with us. If you look at these gifts, what you're gonna notice, look at the first one. See how tall his posture is? And then after you see him land, he's gonna kinda stay tall and then his arms are gonna get stuck. Everything's gonna get stuck, right? His arms are not able to work freely around his body. And then if you go over here to this gif, you're gonna see how open he gets into landing. He's not creating that uh, good lead leg to block against. He's not landing in that good position. We saw all those other guys landing in earlier. Take a look right here. You're gonna see that lead hip kind of leak open as he sinks, okay? And then when you look at this one, you're gonna see how much movement there is before anything actually happens to the barrel, okay? So his inability to consistently get to an effective landing position screwed up everything else that happened after it. See how tall he is with that open pelvis right there? He's stuck and there's no way for him to actually effectively get across his body. See how much rotation he's had here? But look where his barrel still is. It's all the way back here. All these moves didn't help that at all, right? He also individually happened to land with an open front foot and he has about 60 degrees of uh, internal rotation in his lead hip. That's an excessive amount, that's a lot, right? That means that, that if he puts his foot here, right, same position as a guy with 30 degrees, the guy with 30 degrees will stop here, but he keeps going all the way around, okay? And that made it nearly impossible for him to get any kind of cross-body reciprocal movement into impact to the middle of the field because all of his energy was going that way, right? Now, when we think about changing it, how do we train in the weight room, right? Form then test the pattern by adding load. You wouldn't just add load, right? You'd work on pattern first. And if the pattern fails as you go up in weight, right? You drop the load, go back to the pattern, right? You don't add a whole bunch of load to a bad squat pattern, right? So a couple of years ago, I was studying uh, like dynamic systems theory, it was about five or six years ago, and I was reading a book on uh, nuclear power plants. Like their systems have to be perfect, because if they don't, a whole town blows up, right? And they have to learn a whole lot of things, right? So when it comes to like skill acquisition, uh, one of the things I created was, was breaking down an understanding of how to transition these things. A lot of times people say, oh, you can do it in the cage, you can't do it on the field. 
but that's because you have no process, right? We start out with prep work, field work, PVC work, med ball work. We start out without a bat in our hands. When, when hitters or pitchers, for that matter, are in their natural environment, they're swinging a bat, they're hitting a ball, doing things they normally do, it doesn't matter if it's off a tee or live or whatever, like they're not comfortable uh, moving differently than they're used to moving, right? You, you have to unlock the freedom of good movement by getting the bat and ball out of the equation and teaching them what good movement is and what it feels like to actually do that. And then you wanna transfer it through stages of skill acquisition. You don't just wanna uh, go from that to the game, right? You wanna transfer it because that's what makes the most logical sense. So big keys, you gotta start simple. You're not gonna juggle six balls before you can juggle two or three, right? Start simple, okay? Learn the pattern. Learn the movement pattern that you're trying to learn, right? Move in the way that you're trying to move. Get them to move differently. Get them to move more efficiently. Learn the pattern first, okay? Think about it from a musical perspective. If you play an instrument like the piano, okay, uh, and you're a good piano player but not a great one, and you're playing a hard song, man, you're trying to play some Mozart or some Beethoven, something difficult, right? Are you gonna play the whole song every time? Or are you gonna chunk it and break it down to smaller pieces, learn how to play those smaller pieces, right? And then kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, seems that that makes a whole lot more sense, right? You're gonna slow it down, chunk it, and then build it back up. Hitting is no different, right? This is all motor learning, this is all skill acquisition, and that's a, a dynamic and complex skill just like hitting is. Think about dancing. Right now on TikTok, you see all these like uh, uh, shuffle dancers, right? My twins are practicing their shuffles all the time. Well, in watching them try to learn it, when you watch that whole thing, you can't do it. When you break it down into small steps and teach your brain and your body how to do it, you do it a bunch of times, then you add more complex movement, you put it all together. It's the same thing, right? So let's take a look at some of the movement work that we did with this player. Here we're working with a PVC pipe, right? And we're just working on some efficient rotation with direction. We're trying to get the body to peel the leg right, forward, but resist, okay? Uh, here we've added a, a foam pad into the ground to add some instability, okay? Working with the PVC over the back. We're trying some different positions and different planes. Sometimes taking it from the front of the body just to the back of the body or the back to the front can change the entire move completely. Uh, explaining to them different things about direction, right, whether it's that way, this way, pull, can also change and alter the way that they move, right? So you're trying to use all these different implements, right? Instability from below, instability from above, tension, right? Throwing some loop bands around the legs so as they rotate, they have to keep them spread, okay? Trunk stability, holding the bands apart so you gain some stability in the middle of your body, right? Then some, some med ball throws or some, you know, those are really light, those were soccer balls, those work really, really well too, right? Move to some scoop tosses, and we're trying to create a lot of force in a small window of time and space. So you can do any and all of these things and not only change the implements, you can also utilize time constraints, right? So have them close their eyes and when you say go, they move. Right, or stand behind them, and when they hear you clap, that's when they have to get the ball or the object uh, to, the, to the wall or their partner as quickly as they possibly can, okay? There's a lot of different ways to work on this efficient rotation. So uh, on the video on the left, we have a guy hooked up to uh, a belt, and we have a band pulling him back. And he's got his arms helicoptered out so he can feel the plane of rotation and direction while he's actually doing the drill. Here we have a similar version of it, but different. We have him hooked up to a Vertimax, and we have it attached to his back hip, right? So he can feel himself pulling his energy and his body into the ground to compress that lead leg. And here we've added a, a single arm med ball like the helicopter with also some instability uh, from below, right? Just that foam pad again. Okay, now uh, we're working with uh, the foam roller here so he, he understands where his feet are, right? That's just a visual to understand your position. And then he's spreading apart the, the loop band to hold stability in the trunk and he's trying to take the direction of it to the middle of the field, right? A lot of great hitters, not everybody, right? But some of the more vertical bat paths, you're gonna see space held in the arms, right? As they work through the ball. And with this particular player, that's the kind of pattern that we were going for because that's what we felt 
felt would work, make the most sense for his body and how it worked. Now we're on some BOSU balls, right? Some instability from below. We got the bands pulling our legs together and we're trying to resist it and hold them apart. And we're also adding in a water ball, right? That's a physio ball filled with some water uh, trying to throw it, right? So all of these things are challenging their system, right? To continue to move more efficiently with more efficient rotation and direction, okay? So after you do these things, step two is challenge the pattern. Right? Change the drill, the cue, the implement, the feel, right? To keep challenging the pattern to move it through these stages of skill acquisition. But one of the biggest keys, and I can't stress this enough, is that our goal is not to allow the changes to alter the pattern, right? When it's good, right? We want to narrow the bandwidth. And I know that this goes against some conventional motor learning theory and skill acquisition and science, but I have a huge contention with that stuff, and I'll, I'll tell you why, okay? Well, science will tell you no one's ever swung the bat the same way twice or written their name the same way twice, and that's true. It's 100% true. I like to study a lot of things, you know, I like things to make sense. I like them to be logical. And I like to study a lot of things outside of baseball to understand baseball and education better. And there's nobody better than the Greeks when we're looking for logic, right? Um, they had this thing called the one in the many, right? And this is a really powerful thing. So philosophically, I want you to think about drawing five circles, right? I want you to draw five circles. And if you sat down and you did that right now, right? You drew five circles. Uh, is it likely that any of them are going to be identical? No. None of them are going to be identical. None of them are going to be perfectly identical. For that to happen, you would have to put the same amount of pressure uh, with the pen in the same exact way, move the same exact speed to have no variation. It's literally impossible, just like signing your name. 100%. None of them are going to be identical. And mine are gonna look drastically different than yours because we have different understandings in our brain, different mental maps about what that circle is, okay? Now, uh, brings us to number two. Do you think your five circles will look the same or be identical to anyone else's? No, okay, of course not, right? Uh, it's just like DNA and fingerprints, okay? Generally the same, same concept, small differences. While the human body is different for everybody, we all are comprised of many of the same components, right? And while we're all over the world right now, uh, in different temperatured environments, all of our internal body temperature is roughly 98.6, right? But it's not exact. There's variation, there's bandwidth, okay? So do you think it's impossible to draw the same circle twice? It is, right? Well, we've, we've covered that, it is impossible. However, here's the one in the many, okay? The one is the abstract. That's the mental image or the map in, you have in your head of what the perfect circle is, right? Based on the things you observe in the world, the moon, the sun, tires, eyeballs, flowers, we see these things and it gives us an understanding of the abstract, the one, the perfect circle, right? The many exists within the one, right? You, you have the one, that's the abstract, but the many is the real. Right? The abstract is almost more real than the many because of the ever-changing bandwidth, right? But here's the thing. If you wanted to be an artist and you wanted to learn how to draw perfect circles, you wouldn't just say, ah, oh, now it's impossible, why bother? You'd do it slow and then faster. You would change the weight of the pen, the size of the pen, the width of the pen. Uh, you'd learn how to do it standing on one leg. You'd learn how to do it getting on a boat, right? Having it shift you around, right? But trying with all of your power to not allow the ever-changing environment to screw up your ability to control what you're trying to control and draw that perfect circle. And when you really think in your head about the greatest of all time, whether it's Barry Bonds or Mike Trout or Verlander or Max Scherzer or Randy Johnson, what bandwidth did you really see, right? Did, did Randy Johnson ever look like Max Scherzer? No. Does Max Scherzer look like Greg Maddox? No, right? He, he looks like Max Scherzer, and if you closed your eyes right now and thought of Max Scherzer, you'd see one throw. You'd see one delivery. You'd see the big rock signature moves that happen, right? So our goal is to narrow the bandwidth. We want to alter the pattern, and then we want to narrow the bandwidth, right? We need to make this pattern as efficient and as powerful in the shortest window of time and space possible. We don't want to leave tremendous room for variation. We want to get off our A swing more often than everybody else. So we got to alter it, and then we got to narrow it, okay? So as we continue to move forward uh, challenging it, we can add some visuals. 
So here we have uh, the player that was in the evaluation, and he's doing some uh, bottom hand throws. So he's in a landing position right here, a little angled close, and because he has that 60 degrees of IR in the lead hip, that's really important for him. That played a huge role in what happened, okay? So the bands are just trying to hold it and spread it apart, right? And he's trying to throw the ball forward with force. So we're adding in visual, we're adding in direction. Here, this is one of our young players, he's in high school. He came up with this on his own, right? This was quarantine, this was COVID. He didn't have anybody to throw him the ball to do the helicopter drills. So a 14 year old literally came up with a great drill. We have guys come up with stuff all the time, right? Because it's not about what we know, it's about continuing to figure out how can we do it better. And that worked really well for him. That's a good drill for him. And here, he liked this one a lot too. He's taking the water bag and trying to strike a ball with it. Right, so a little instability from above with a visual of trying to actually attack a ball, okay? Here, two of our pro players, okay? Uh, on the left, right, um, he's got some bands again, trying to uh, pull them together while he's trying to hold it apart. And both of these balls are filled with some water, right? Uh, seven to 10 pounds. If you are not using water-filled implements for training, um, go get them now. Right, uh, because they are gonna continue to change everything about the way that we understand human performance and, uh, and all of it, okay? The instability, right, the sloshing around of the water creates constant co-contractions in the body, right, which forces us to stabilize and react with stabilization, which creates deceleration, right? So water balls are absolutely amazing. So we have the directional component here. Now take a look at this big donkey, 6'3", uh, 230, ran a 6.5 at his pro day. Um, take a look at his hips right here. At the end of his throw, see how he switches his feet? He came up with that two minutes before that video was taken. He was doing these and said, wait a second, what if I add another reciprocal move to it? And he did that, and he absolutely loves those, right? So, bracing, stability, reciprocal movement, adjustability. We're adding in these components to our movement training. Okay, if we take a look at this one, this is one of my favorites, okay, because of all the things that it actually adds. So we take a look at this one. This is a water ball. We're doing a forward chain into a catch of a water ball. We're back chaining it and then throwing it. At the catch, the water is gonna slosh around. You literally have to brace and stabilize for impact, okay? And you can learn how to do it from all different compromised positions. So in this drill, not only are you working on your body, but you can pump that thing hard in without them knowing, and they have to create space and they have to brace on the inside pitch. You can throw that ball with arc soft down and away, and now they have to go get it way out front from a compromised position and still stabilize from that position and actually accept some force Force and gain some stability. So these water ball catches are, are absolutely one of our go-tos and one of our favorites. Step three, we're gonna blend the isolated patterns that are addressing specifics into more complex and dynamic movements, right? We're, we're gonna continue to challenge the system, right? So what does that look like, okay? We're, right here, we're creating force production, reciprocal movement, forward move, working on the forward move, directional force, right? On the bottom left, right, we're doing a hop. We're producing force up. We have to accept it when we land. We gotta have a good forward move. And then we gotta take that water and we gotta get it to slosh forward as quick as we can, which means we need to decel really fast with direction. Here we have some shuffle throws with the water ball, right? As long as you get into that front side to throw that ball, like the, the drill in and of itself, shuffling to throw the med ball forward, creates good movement. If you land poorly, you're never gonna be able to deliver the force appropriately with direction. If you stay stuck on the backside, you're never gonna be able to create force with direction, right? You have to literally get into the front side to block off the energy, and as soon as that happens and the backside releases, when you try to turn, that back foot is going behind. This kid over rotates like big time normally. As soon as we did this, that's what happened. Literally, right away, that's what happened, right? Just trying to produce force in that drill. On this one, we're trying to rotate the, the ball, has water in it again from a landing position, and we're trying to stop that water as fast as we can, right? Remember, force production with direction in small windows of time and space. Step four, repeat the process and continue to blend things together. I used to think, right, and this is what I used to do, right, 10 years ago, we were doing this drill 50 times, then we're gonna do that drill 50 times, then we're gonna go to regular swings, right? 
it doesn't work as well, right? Like you, you want to learn the moves, but then as you move forward, you want to blend stuff together. So as you transition, like uh, say from T to toss or from movement work to T or movement work to toss, uh, you do the first couple and they feel great, they're good. But then the results aren't as good, you're not moving as well. Don't keep going, dummy. Like stop grab the water ball or do the exercise that was helping to create the good moves in the first place and then go back to swings. And just keep blending back and forth so you can continue to feel those feelings and chase those feelings and chase those good movements. Again, back to the process, right? Just keep moving down the line through those stages of skill acquisition and continue to make it more game-like and more realistic through the process while trying not to allow the pattern to change. We're trying to create better movement. We're trying to alter movement, not keep doing the same thing that we've been doing, getting the results we've been getting, okay? So now we're gonna look at some actual hitting. Seated swings, man, I have fallen in love with these. We don't do them with everybody, obviously, right? But uh, man, do I like what they create. Um, so when this kid came in, uh, he's a draft guy, major division one player, uh, definitely a bunch of barrel drag and, and kind of stuck, right? He's like uh, the other pro guy was, he's super loose. So even though he's physical and he has muscles, he's not tight. He's got a lot of room to move around. And as a result, he has problems creating stability, right? The more mo mobility you have, the less stability you actually have. You're sacrificing one for the other. So he's not very stable. When we sit in this chair, we're able to isolate the trunk and the hands and the barrel, right? And we're able to connect the movement of this to the movement of that and actually striking an object, right? You can do this off the tee, you can do this with toss, you can do this hitting basketballs or volleyballs or whatever. You can do it a million different ways. Uh, but I've seen it create a lot of amazing things, varying patterns. Not all guys that do it, you're not seeing the same moves, right? But the moves that get created are often really, really, really good, right? Um, so this is one of our uh, pro guys, one of the big leaguers and he's doing the seated swings. Now, normally he gets pretty steep and that lead elbow, it kind of gets pinned, right? It never actually clears to come through. As soon as we did these, that lead elbow was working up because the ball is here on him and he's having to clear to work through. These are some of the best swings, right? Uh, the best patterns on the backside that the guy's ever had, right? Just by sitting and throwing toss and having him try to strike the ball and figure out how to do it from, from that position, okay? Now, you move to T work. One of the things that we do, you'll notice there's no forward move here, okay? Um, we've had players, like guys that we've had amazing results with, um, that during their off season, those professionals I'm talking about, in that four month stretch, we didn't touch a bat for the first month and a half. And when we went to the bat, we, we didn't do any forward moves. And I'm not saying you should always do it this way. By any stretch of means, we don't. Uh, but like working on efficient rotation is huge. And I really don't care what a guy does before as long as he gets to good positions and moves through them well, right? And for some guys, their move helps them get there. For other guys, it hurts. So if we can isolate those efficient, like efficient rotation, then we can learn later how to get to it. And again, we've had some amazing results. We didn't even touch the forward move with the bat until like a month or a month and a half before they left. And amazing results, okay? Um, so efficient rotation is the key. And you can do that from a lot of different positions. You can change the angles of the feet, which is gonna change the moves. You can uh, change the angles of the, um, uh, the legs, right? Uh, and that's gonna change the moves. You can work open for depth and then closed for getting cross body. It's a million different ways you can alter it, right? Uh, but I think the big key is doing it for specific reasons, not just throwing crap against the wall, seeing what sticks, right? Like try to find the problem, find the virus, and try to eradicate it with intelligent and, and, and uh, uh, very well-crafted uh, thoughts and drills that you think will specifically address uh, these inefficiencies that you see in your players, okay? So here's another variation. So we're going anchored, but we got two T's here, okay? Uh, I like this one a lot, and the players do as well. So this T is low and, uh, I think it was in more, and this T is up and away, all right? So uh, the goal here, he's in launch, and I'm calling one, two, A, or B, right? Uh, one, B, two, A. You don't want to make it one, A, two, B, because in their brain, then it's the same thing, and they always know. You want it to be difficult for them to solve the problem. I've even had to go to uh, saying 
uh, other languages, like one, two, uno, dos. Like that's one and dos and that's two and uno. And I'm standing off to the side or the coach is standing off to the side and then calling something out and their job is to react appropriately to the right ball and strike it efficiently, right? So that's a way to challenge the pattern, challenge the system. Okay, now this one's gonna look funny, but boy was this one huge for this guy. So this guy is like 5'10", super twitchy, best athlete in the entire organization. When they called me to send him, they said, look, we drafted this guy a couple of years ago and he's best athlete in the whole system. One, we can't keep the guy healthy, and two, he's just underperforming. He is crazy twitchy. Like when we did his evaluation, he was landing open and still getting counter rotation, which means, boy, can he pull out slack from some really bad positions, right? But it made sense. He had no space. He couldn't have direction. So his posture, he's up real tall. And when you think about it, he's 5'10". So he's always kind of wanted to be that way, but hasn't really gotten any posture. By elevating his feet on the tires, first of all, the tires, you don't want to fall off, right? So you're not going to move them around too much, right? You're going to keep them stable. And by elevating him from the toss and then throwing down here, it forced him to gain a whole bunch of posture to really feel what it's like to hit a ball below him. We basically took a guy that's 5'10", made him 6'5", right? And, and got him to feel what it's like to rotate and put force into the floor. This was one of the best drills for him. It was one of his favorite, and it created some really nasty moves, right? Um, striking heavy objects. Uh, this is absolutely spectacular. It doesn't matter who you are, what age level you are. Uh, works for a uh, tremendous amount of people, right? It's a good thing to do. I don't care who you are. This is something you should do with all of your hitters because this is helping us ball strike, strike an object, and feel that moment of impact, right? Now, heavy balls are good, right? But I, I like things filled with air better. So like soccer balls, and hitting a heavy bag is good too, but like soccer balls, basketballs, volleyballs, that type of thing. Because when you make, when you get to impact, you're gonna feel the bat and the ball like gonna bounce off each other. It's gonna create a stopping moment, right? You don't wanna teach mechanics, you wanna teach feelings. If you get somebody to feel that, right, and they're a good athlete, and then you say, okay, now do that to the ball. You're gonna see different movements show up. Throw a K-Vest on a guy, get in the lab, do it. I promise you, you're gonna see different things, right? It's helping them move more efficiently and learn how to actually strike the object. So hit lots of heavy stuff, okay? Or not even heavy, but like, you know, basketballs aren't heavy, uh, but compress and strike a lot of different objects would be a better way to say it. So in this next video, what you're gonna see um, is us transferring through those stages of skill acquisition. Uh, we're working off a machine, right? But again, we're going from launch. One of the things with machines that I hate the most is that when guys hit off of machines, like it forces them to stay back in a way that gets them stuck on top of their backside. It's like they're holding and waiting, right? Because they can't actually, re when you're hitting normally, you're reading the human movement of the pitcher and you're timing your moves off of theirs. With a the machine, when the ball just pops out and jumps on you, it creates a lot of bad movement patterns, right? And you could look at it like a challenge, and it is, but I just don't think it helps guys as much as it really, you know, the idea of it does. But seeing breaking balls, high velo, all good. We just like to do it with drills, right? So anchored various positions, single leg, uh, like all different variations, right? But when they don't have to actually move forward, now they can, you can really challenge the velo with some efficient rotation. It kind of goes back to that whole thought of like, get the front foot down early, right? Does anyone actually get it down early? No. Guys have to think about it differently to do it. But all those coaches that said it, we're trying to get guys into the ground because once it's into the ground, now it can't open up into landing and peel you off. Yet another old school thing that actually works and players need to stop just, uh, Pissing it away and saying it doesn't work, and so do coaches, okay? Get the front foot down early is a great cue, okay? So let's take a look at these videos.
So when you watch those swings, right? Like the, they're not all exactly the same. They're not all perfect, but we're hitting all of the big rocks, right? We're narrowing his bandwidth. If you remember the evaluation video, which was taken like two months before that, like, you know, his game swings, because we evaluate in-house too, but we want to see game swings. Remember, it's got to happen at seven o'clock, right? So in his game swings, he was opening up early into landing. He didn't know how to put force into the ground against his lead leg with direction. And in those swings, challenging him with velocity off of a machine from a wide base already in the ground, after all that movement work, it helped all of it start to take shape. So the next thing is starting to work on forward moves, okay? And a big piece of that is just understanding how the upper body and, and the pelvis need to work. So let's take a, take a look at this video. So right here, we're using a band to hold stability in the trunk. And we're working on learning how to isolate and control the pelvis. When you see a lot of the greatest of all time, as they move forward, you're gonna see their knee work towards the catcher. You're gonna see their backside start to get a little bit of rotation. So we're really trying to isolate that move, right? And try to feel out what it's like. Um, and there's a million different ways uh, you can alter this, right? Um, you can take their shoes off so they can feel the ground better, which I recommend you do with all of your players. Uh, you can do it on foam rollers. Um, literally a million different ways you can manipulate the drill uh, to create the movement that you're actually excuse me, looking for. Um, so shuffle swings, right? After you, if you have a guy that the shuffle med balls or shuffle water balls are working with, shuffle swings are fantastic. The goal is not to swing as hard as you can. The goal is not to uh, uh, move as fast as you can. The goal is to strike the ball as effectively, as hard as you can, right? So you wanna transfer those shuffle throws into shuffle swings, okay? And you wanna generally see two shuffles forward. When guys do it once, you don't see the same type of good moves in athleticism. You want them to kinda of shuffle twice because that second shuffle is when you're really gonna see the good stuff uh, start to happen, right? And it really doesn't matter. We do these with big leaguers, you do them with uh, little kids and you see a lot of good stuff uh, start to show up, okay? Again, the process, right? Uh, just transferring through all these stages of skill acquisition, trying to continue to work uh, towards more game-like things, okay? Now let's talk about cues for a second, okay? Because this is, a, this is a powerful one. So this is one of the best cues we've ever come up with, and I'm gonna explain why. So this all started a couple of years ago. I was with one of our hitters, he was a college player, and we were trying to figure out uh, how to get him to understand what he needed to do differently to produce better results, right? And he's built like Trout. Like the dude is 6'3", 230, ran a 6'5 at the pro day, can hit a ball. I've seen him hit a ball 121 from the right and 114 from the left. And he's not even left-handed, right? So I was looking at Trout swings and I saw this ball he hit off of Maeda a couple of years ago. It was like 454 to the pull side, just an absolute nuke. And at the end, you see his front foot step across, right? And then I started to think to myself, well, the brain maps backwards, right? If you think about something at the end of the chain, things earlier tend to help clean up. So I said, hey, do me a favor. Take a look at this swing, right? Take a look at this swing. See how he steps across with his lead leg at the end of the swing? I want you to try that, okay? Now, while Mike Trout doesn't think about it, right? He just does it. Um, and this little kid right here, right? Look at his dad's face. Look at him looking at his kid. He thinks he's got a big leaguer already, right? This kid's like six years old, hit a ball over the trees in the backyard. Dad's like, holy cow, son, we got something good going on. Take a look at his front foot. Does the same thing. He's not trying to do it either, right? When it comes to teaching and when it comes to cues, like um, just because someone doesn't think about it doesn't mean someone else shouldn't. Right, everybody has different things that they think and try to do. Jose Altuve learned the kickback from Miguel Cabrera. Now you still can find video of him doing it in the minor leagues, but not as effectively, not nearly as much, and he didn't think he was supposed to. As soon as he was made aware of it, that he was supposed to do it, he was able to blow up using it, okay? So just because one person thinks about it and the other person doesn't, doesn't mean that people shouldn't think about it. So what actually happened with that player that I mentioned? Well. Here he is. This is him and this is Trout. This is from that day, right? That day. Uh, that's pretty amazing. For a guy with an engine that large, there was a tremendous over rotator and his pelvis wouldn't stop until like 95 degrees because he was, he's big and strong. He has a huge engine. He was swinging as hard as he could. That's what he thought he should do. That's what he was bought in on, right? 
Well, that's pretty different, just by a thought, right, by a cue. Let's take a look at it in forward and reverse, because I think that's almost more impressive. Look at that. We got some similar patterns going on there. That's pretty good, okay? Now, what happened in the results? Well, remember that slide from earlier uh, in the first presentation about how it's to transfer to 7 o'clock? Well, that was him. That was the swing change that we made that literally changed his career, and he ended up getting drafted. And he'll tell you the same thing, right? The year before, numbers not good. That season, numbers not good. Came in one weekend to try to figure it out and after that, everything blew up, and now he's playing professional baseball. That is the power of player development. It could be a cue, it could be a drill, it could be anything. It can literally be anything. The goal is to figure out what it is with each player, okay? Results don't lie, guys. Like, it has to happen at seven o'clock when the lights turn on. Cage bombs are cute, but, but it needs to happen when the lights turn on, and working on good movement helps create those things, right? That's what helps create it, at least that's what that's what we've found. That's what I've found in these years to be the most effective. Let's see what his game swings ended up looking like. Some BP. Pretty different than that evaluation video, huh? Aye. That ball was hit, I think it was like 460. He laid some weight into that one, didn't he? Like, it, he stuck that ball, right? You, you see the compression, you see the difference in the movement, right? So what did that do for him in his career? Like, what did that do for this particular guy that spent 200 hours on movement work and training in an off season? Well, he was a five-year minor league player that was hitting 250, I think he was a career 250 some odd guy prior to that. Well, the next year, uh, let's see. Now, when you take a look at the positional differences, right, this was those evaluation pictures, right? No posture, up tall, pelvis open, right? Body turning, barrel dragging, not so much here. Look how early the pelvis stops. Look how fast the barrel outraces the hands. All of the, that training, all that movement work took shape, right? It took shape and it created what we needed it to, it to create. When you look from the front view, right, you're going to see the same thing. See how much leaked open, hands stuck in, completely stuck here. Look at the differential in posture. Look at the differential in the landing position. See how open and tall versus posture and closed, right? The movement work is essential because that's going to allow it to take shape in the games where they can do it without thinking about it. That's how you get it to actually transfer. You have to work, in my opinion, through all of those different stages and getting them to understand it, okay? Um, now, in-season adjustments are always going to be necessary. So this particular player, let's take a look at the text real quick. Um, I was watching him hit, well, I, w I wasn't actually watching him hit, I was looking at his numbers, right, because we hadn't spoken in a little bit, um, and I saw that his numbers were going down. So I sent him a text, and he sends me back, yes, my front shoulder and hips have been flying open the past couple games, and I've been chasing everything high and low. I'm not seeing it. The reason I knew that without actually looking at his swings is because he always has the same issues, the same ugly stuff. The bad patterns don't go away forever. They just become more dormant. And that's why we need to be aware of them and keep working on them the same kind of ways, right, th through our training stuff, right? So then I sent him back. I haven't watched one at bat. I sent you that text because I saw your numbers and already knew. How might you ask? Because it's always the same stuff. Now, this was a minor leaguer, right? This was a minor leaguer. So through that conversation, okay, um, like I gave him a thought and it worked. Let's take a look at before. So in his forward move, this is him into landing, right? You can see how that pelvis wants to leak open and that foot wants to leak open. It looks kind of like he's stacking on his backside too much instead of really going forward, okay? So literally gave him one thought and it worked. Look what I got. T take a effing look at that, mother effer, you're an effing genius, right? One cue, one thought, okay? So he ended up hitting like six jacks, I think, in his next uh, 
I don't know, like 15 games or something like that after being in a slump, right? But sometimes it's just that one little thing. So you need in-season maintenance, in-season adjustment. You have to understand, like what Mookie said, uh, you have to be able to look at video and analyze without overthinking it, right? But you have to have a plan. You gotta have a go-to. Now ultimately, like, like we said earlier, results don't lie. So that player earlier hit 264 the season before and then hit 346, slugging 457 to 570 and OPS 783 to 958. And oh, by the way, he made his big league debut and he stuck and he ended up hitting the middle of the order for a major league baseball team the next season or in the season after that, right? So this is a player that was a career minor leaguer underperforming and then after all that time spent on moving differently, uh, he did and got better results, okay? Our average percent of increase in batting average, this is an average, right, with our pro players, 32%. Average increase of slugging, 39. Average increase of OPS, 32. Lowest increase, 0 0.018, 0 0.016, 0 0.090. Movement work gets results, guys. I haven't found anything better than what I'm presenting to you right now, right? This is a snippet of what we do, but I'm trying to share with you some of the big rock principles of how we created these results and what this whole process uh, actually looked like to, uh, to navigate through. So anybody that hasn't read it yet, if any of you are interested in more information from us or like what you heard today, uh, I published a book a couple of years ago called Old School Versus New School, The Application of Data and Technology into Baseball, uh, learning how to blend the new school real generation with the old school feel generation. And we go into human movement, the body. Uh, we, the, I wanted there to be something for everybody, whether you're a strength coach, a hitting coach, a pitching coach, doesn't matter, right? Um, and I think that we did, a, we did a good job with that. We're really proud of the, of the product. Uh, we also came out with educational courses, right? And these courses are kind of like the book on steroids, right? Think about everything that we kind of talked about in three hours today, but really streamlined and a little bit more in depth, right? And then to back up the courses, uh, we ended up creating a website and a coach's mentorship program, right? So think about the courses like uh, why we do it. Uh, think about um, it's, the, it's the why, uh, it's the what, but this is the how. We're literally educating coaches and working with them on how they can make their players better. We're doing Zooms with them. Uh, we have groups where we communicate back and forth. Uh, and they have access to a tremendous amount of information on how we train players broken up into uh, some, really, some really cool pieces. Uh, we're, we're really happy with it. And even Jerry Weinstein, the consummate learner, the guy's been in professional baseball longer than most of us have uh, been alive. Um, you know, this was an amazing comment from him that uh, he took both level one courses and took 50 pages of notes. Um, and J-Dub has become a great friend over the last couple of years and uh, just absolutely love that guy, always trying to learn. And uh, Zach Daycamp from uh, TCU, he's the head strength coach. He's probably the best strength guy like in the, in the country, especially for baseball. Um, and he's a huge supporter as well and we do a lot of collaboration with him. Uh, we also do a lot of consulting, right? MLB organizations, colleges, high schools, facilities. So if any of you have any interest in getting some consulting services set up with us, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can reach out to us at uh, 108 Performance um, on our Twitter, Instagram, all those different forms of communication. Uh, we got our number or email. This is the biomechanics lab that we work with uh, that you can reach out to as well. Um, thank you guys so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it's a true honor and a blessing to be able to share this stuff with you guys today, and I hope everybody got something out of it. Thanks so much.